So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on 2020 growth trends for revenue-driven leaders, leaders emerging stronger in the new norm. So I'm Colette, and I head up events and field marketing at Wakado, and I'll be your host for today. We're just a couple of months away from the end of the year, and a lot has since changed in this new world. And so today, we have the honor of inviting three revenue-driven leaders in a discussion to hear and learn about the 2020 growth trends that they are seeing and what you should look out for. So before bringing on our speakers for today, I'll be running through some housekeeping notes. So this is a live webinar and the webinar is being recorded. We will be sending you the recording after the webinar. To show appreciation for joining in in today's webinar, stay till the end of the webinar to qualify for a chance to win an exclusive wine bottle. Mm -hmm. So we will be doing a live Q&A at the end of the session and you can submit your questions on the Pigeonhole platform. So you can scan the QR code right here using your mobile phone right now and enter into the platform. Or what you can also do um, is click into the link, which I've provided in the chat box, and you can drop your questions in any time. You can also upvote questions that you see in there. And um, at the end of the webinar, our speakers will be addressing those questions. So moving on to introducing our amazing speakers for today, we have Rishi, the head of growth, at Wakado, uh, Guon Gaban, uh, also known as G, hope I pronounced that right, who's the growth yeah. advisor, <laughs> who's the growth advisor and a B2B, for B2B SaaS startups like G2, Meta, Meta uh, Data, as well as Intellimize, and also Chris Newton, the VP of Marketing at Intellimize, joining us today. So I'll now hand over the time to the rest of our speakers. So G, I'll let you kick things off. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Colette. Um, awesome. Great to have you, Rishi and Chris, uh, with me today. Uh, it's going to be an exciting discussion. So reminder, we're going to talk of like <clears throat> uh, how to emerge stronger into this new norm. And let's also be very practical and tactical and try to share like what we've seen um, in the past couple of months. Um, and both of you are like marketing leaders. Like what are you planning for the next couple of months and especially as we're all right now going to 2021 uh, planning mode like what are your strategies how are you going to grow next year with all of this uncertainty and uh and we'll, we'll cover i'd say uh, a lot of that and some of i'd say uh the the changes uh, that we've seen um so i'll kick it off with the uh first uh discussion that i want um which is um what are the growth trends that you're seeing in uh, 2020? I'll make it easy. I'll, I'll start uh, myself, right? So uh, on my end, what I'm seeing is uh, clearly, and you know, I've, I, I advise multiple companies so I can do some pattern matching. I see the similarities, at least in B2B SaaS. What I'm seeing is a restriction in the number of channels. Less channels are available uh, than before. And the, the obvious culprits, um, we don't have in-person events anymore, right? But there's also less obvious ones. Like for example, uh, as our budgets have all shifted towards uh, virtual, then the CPCs have gone up, right? There's more competition. And so that has deteriorated the performance of some of those channels. And so what I'm seeing is interestingly, I'm seeing companies become more um, aggressive right? Especially after the period of uncertainty that we had in like March, April, since at say end of April, beginning of May, I've seen companies become a lot uh, more aggressive. Um, and there's uh, two ways that I've seen them become more aggressive and, and we'll discuss more about that later. Um, it's uh, paying more to get people to listen to your pitch. And the second is doing a lot more uh, events that they own companies tended to uh, have a significant event budget that they would uh, give to uh, event organizers to organize for them, right? And that has shifted mostly to in-house events, right? Uh, and the return on investment of that is something I'm really curious to discuss with everybody today. Uh, Chris, over to you. Uh, what's your perspective on 2020? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Intellimize as a company, we work with a lot of customers to optimize what's going on on their website so we can run, you know, literally millions of experiments to understand 
what's going to work best for different uh, visitors as they come through on the site and personalize that experience for each person. So we have great access into understanding what's happening with web traffic and conversion rates and so forth. Um, so one thing that we've really observed, you know, as, as G mentions, there's a restriction in channels, but the website is one that's, you know, really Im important. We do see that traffic increasing, you know, considerably. And we see, uh, you know, conversion rates. Usually when traffic goes up, conversion rates go down. Um, but the conversion rates haven't fallen as far. So the net effect is, is uh, in a place where more things are happening on those websites. And so I think a big trend for 2020 is going to continue to be people refocusing on, you know, you know, arguably one of the biggest assets in their, their marketing stack, which is that website. You know, if someone learns about you on a webinar like we're having today or, uh, you know, other paid ad or whatever, they're always coming back to a landing page and ultimately that site. Um, and the more things that you can do there to really engage your audience and connect with them, um, you know, the better. Uh, that said, the other channels like email and social, because we're focused on those, I think we're going to increase. I think, gee, you might have mentioned some data last time we were talking about, um, you know, increasing emails and people's willingness to accept and, and see more emails yep. come into their inbox than before. And I think that's fascinating how these channels interact and, and, and people change behavior and what what they're willing to do to interact with organizations and companies. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Rishi, I want to hear what, uh, what's going on to Workado. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, we're, we're fortunate enough to have uh, a number of um, a large number of marketing leaders sort of leveraging the platform to really extract as much value out of their tech stacks as possible. So with Workado being able to automate workflows and anything that you can really dream up that you would want to be doing with, with your stack or being making data available, um, you can do with the platform. And what we've seen with our customers is that um, budgets have been really interesting this year, right? Uh, in terms of uh, what they're allowed to spend on. Um, I mean, obviously uh, budgets are the first thing that are looked at, especially in the marketing department. But the one thing that we've seen is that there's even an equal, if not more reliance on technology today um, than there was even a year ago, uh, especially with mixing with what's happening in the space, mm -hmm. along with the work from home environment, um, you know, the reliance on tech is, is, is ever increasing. Um, you know, one thing that, uh, you know, has been really helpful for us and a lot of our customers is really, I think two things. One is, uh, keeping a very close ear to the ground in terms of what's happening. So those same search terms that used to potentially work for you in the past, um, are not necessarily what people are looking for today, right. Um, in terms of the needs that they have, they have this still, uh, a reliance on, on technology, but what they might be searching for, uh, things like uh, what they can do with Zoom in various aspects of their business, what they can do with collaboration tools in various aspects of their business. It's interesting how where we work from is impacting how we actually uh, market or grow our companies uh, today. Um, and really figuring out ways where customers are now investing a lot of time in how can they keep a close ear to the ground? How can they look at what's happening in their business to understand the changes that their customers are having? And I think some of the things that, um, you know, wanted to talk about today was, you know, one, how are people keeping close ear to the ground? And two, um, with the sort of traffic and the leads that they're getting today, how they're extracting as much value out of those as possible. I think those would be some interesting topics to hit on. Awesome. Uh, I wrote that down so we can uh, come back to it. So the, the first thing, uh, uh, the first topic I want to cover is some stuff on, first I'm going to share some data. And the topic is uh, virtual events. We're in a virtual event right now. Uh, but I was more thinking of like larger virtual settings where transferring in-person conferences to online like a full day or, a, uh, or maybe a multi-day, multi-day, uh, I'd say a stage uh, event. Uh, before I go into that, like Rishi at Workado, like, have you already organized something like that? We have, we have, and and much thanks to Colette, who's on the on the call. She she leads a lot of these, but um, you know, we actually had our we we host our own sort of user conference, um, and uh, it's a conference really focused on um, business technology leaders across the board. Uh, it's called Magic, and we had it. Um, Great about name. a month, month and a half ago. Um, yeah, it's really, it's, it's you know, uh, I think these <laughs> business technology folk, they really create magic inside the org. 
Um, but, uh, you know, we had, um, talking about what, what is happening with events, it's, uh, your venue is virtual, right? And so the, the threshold to get someone to attend your event is a lot, lot uh, easier uh, yeah. and your reach is, is a lot broader. And so, you know, we saw uh, almost a 10x lift in the number of attendees this year than we had from the previous year. And I think of part of that is uh, one based on the topics that we're talking about. And obviously part of it too, is that now our reach is broader. And so the challenge yeah. for us is how can we actually make those events interesting and useful for the folks that are attending from uh, uh -huh. the speakers and the panelists that we had to breakout rooms uh to uh networking events um and i think you know i think we we walked away with something interesting but it was a complete 180 from how we normally do events so so let me share some data so uh, that and then i want to see if you can also share some of your own. So, but like, as you said, you're right, like virtual events are here to stay, right? And, and we had like limited experience before, before this year. And now we're spending a lot, like we're shifting. And I'm sure before like Wakata was spending significant amount in person. And now we've shifted that to virtual. And marketing leaders are wondering how much should they spend? What's the right amount of spend? And what should they expect in terms of return, in terms of leads generated? Because that's, you know, that's what we're going for, right? We want to generate leads, right? Should you uh, pay for an expensive guest speaker, right? Should you send gifts to people's homes, right? Or should you follow up with them afterwards? So I actually uh, asked uh, four different companies before this webinar, uh, and I, I found different type of models. So I, I can't give company names, but basically uh, hear this out. You have one company, they have attendees in the thousands. The cost of the one day event is $110,000 gross. The net is 45K after sponsorship. So really good job on sponsorship there. Really, really strong game, all right? 50% of the cost went to two speakers, okay? So 50K went to two speakers, all right? And the rest was to production swag and whatnot. Um, and um, that's company number one, uh, really satisfied. Company number two, still attendees in the, in the thousands. They spent less than 5K, of which <laughs> 3K was paid by sponsors. So their net cost was 2K. And they built their own platform. Uh, they saved. They told me that if they had to pay for a platform, it would have been extra fifteen. Um, and they had a hundred and thirty pre-recorded videos. Okay. Um, and the fourth company, smaller, sponsors events. So they're one of the few that I've heard that actually sponsors existing events that have transitioned online. Um, they have a full-time person running two to three events uh, sponsors a, a month. Uh, and they pay 20 to 30K uh, for that, and it generates uh, about 100K in revenue. So there's a, a 3X left, which is pretty good. So that I, that's what I see. I'm like, wow, the spectrum is big. That's a big spectrum, like from 100K to 5K, all right, for in house events um, with similar number of attendees. And so I wanted to, to get your take uh, on uh, Rishi and Chris on like how you think include that, those kind of budgets. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I think there's. I mean, you hit on some great points there, G. I think, and I think it's it's important distinction to break out one the events that you host on your own versus the events that you obviously you attend. Uh, and I think the the playbook is um, it's actually very different. Uh, you know, the the events that you attend. You know, the the way that we look at it is events that we attend. Um, there's a lot of research that goes into what is actually available to us at the event. Uh, do we have a virtual booth? Is there opportunity to have uh, a speaking session to or, or a working session or a workshop to actually educate our users? Is it just a sort of uh, free for all networking event? We've all been to those. Um, and uh, how, that, how that actually turns out. I think you know, the networking events in, in, in person were wonderful. Uh, we had some uh, huge success with that. Virtual, it's much more difficult uh, to keep yeah. someone's attention who might be working from home and to, they're taking care of their kids in the background. So I think from a, uh, you know, how we decide how do we spend on events that we attend, a lot of it depends on, um, you know, do we have more of these tangible activities that increase more one-on-one -on -one interaction, workshops, booths, things of that sort. Uh, for the events that we host ourselves, I think obviously those same things are important. But then I think on top of that too, uh, there's always an intangible when it comes to your own event that you can't necessarily measure. Uh, there's, uh, there's value to potentially having 
uh, dominance in the space of your brand. There's value to um, you know someone attending your event uh, versus uh, you know a potential competitor in the space that may not have an event or has an event, but it's much smaller. There's an intangible there too that um, you know I don't think all marketing activities. Some people may disagree can always be measured with ROI, um, but uh, I, I think you have to look at it from. From both angles and i'm sure that's a topic as well g a hundred percent a hundred percent before we get to that uh chris how are you thinking about events right now virtual events but it's you know as we think about these virtual events what what we've found to be most important is you you have to have a way to get that connection you talked about you know some losing some of the the the, the interaction that you have at an in-person event we focus on smaller uh, for the events that we've produced smaller networking events and and we're thinking you know, like eight people, 10 people that you can actually connect with and, and have a conversation that leads to follow on and additional conversations has worked better for us. Um, you don't get the distraction that you get. You know, I know people are working at home and maybe their kid or their dog or something, you know, can be a distraction for a moment, but because there's that smaller, uh, more participatory conversation happening, mm. you don't lose people to other apps or things that they're doing on their computer, they are engaged. In, in, and for us, that's really been the, the secret. Um, we haven't decided to tackle a, you know, a thousand person event or set up something like that. Um, we would want to have a better understanding of how we would get the kind of participation we were looking for, you know, if we, if we did that. Um, and so that would be the concern for us. And, and, and it sounds like we've that's got fair. a little bit to learn there. That's fair. And just to close that topic, I actually uh, helped uh, one of the growth conferences in this space um, to think through like how they value the value that they give. Uh, and I told them like, you give me an audience like, listening to my content, but the engagement isn't there, as you just said, Chris. Well, I don't know if it's there, right? I just don't know. And then I'm trying to chase all those people with emails to try and book demos. And it's just not super efficient, but I would be ready to pay a hundred times more if you made intros with a very small fraction of the people who are in my, in my ideal customer profile, and we made a test, and they're actually executing, executing that for this December, which is instead of charging you for like a, a typical sponsorship, they charge you for an agreed number of demos ahead of time, right? Uh, that they make intros to. And so I'd it's say really like- a double opt-in thing where the, the people getting- It's the an intro. Are... It's an intro email. They, the uh, conference organizer will intro the sponsor to a few selected key attendees that attended, right? And make sure that there's, that there's a conversation that happens, right? And so I love that concept of making sure that this, this discussion, as Rishi was saying, like, this, like the, the value is being able to like more than if network, but talk with other people, right? On this one-on-one. -on -one. And like, whether it's like by making the event smaller, so it can happen, as you said, or by making direct intros, both are good ways to get there. So, yeah, I love the innovation. Um, That's a great uh, way to approach it. It makes it an easier sponsor conversation, sponsorship conversation, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and I really liked, Chris, what you said. You know, one of the things that has also worked really well for us, I think, you know, there's a typical mold of, you know, a, an event that you sponsor or an event that you host. Another thing that's been really useful for us, and I think this kind of goes back to, Chris, what you were talking about in terms of what you used to do in person is, um, you know, more smaller, we call them sort of virtual dinners, if you will, where we will, um, and half of it is mixed up of, of, of our actual customers and half of it may be prospects or, or any referrals. Um, and, you know, we'll send them a, a, a drink or, or a dinner uh, or an Uber Eats gift card for that specific event. And it might be a group of six or eight. Uh, and we're all having a glass of wine or, or having a, a nice meal together while discussing something. And I think those have also been, uh, I mean, again, as much as you can increase that interaction uh, have been really awesome. Yeah, for us, we did the Speaking same lunch and dinner ahead, um, and breakfast. And, you know, it's interesting. We found good engagement at, at different times of day. Um, and so, you know, I'd suggest experimenting with that as well. Dinner can start to get chaotic at, at home. And so we found some better uh, participation earlier. I know we got to move on to the next thing, G. I'll, I'll be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I mean, speaking of wine and dinner, that's actually a great segue into the next topic, which is giving stuff to people to incentivize them for the uh, desired action, right? And um, quick intro, and then we're going to do a poll, right? And for those actually, by the way, who forgot, if you stick into the end, Colette's giving somebody a bottle of wine. So great way to talk about wine. So driving demo requests with incentives. 
Okay, so examples like, like uh, good gift cards, uh, wine, uh, maybe headsets, AirPods are, are the norm, right? Um, and there's different ways that I see uh, people uh, do that. Um, there's uh, basically either it is before the demo to drive at say the demo itself, right? So you actually in the outbound email or whatever form of communication, you can say, hey, if you do the demo, you will get this object of value. Or between the, de the demo booked and the demo attended to drive attendance, okay? Before I give my numbers, uh, I would like uh, a Colette uh, to put up the poll for everybody. And the poll question is, would you send a gift uh, before getting the meeting booked? Okay, um, I love if people could answer uh, and say whether they would, they wouldn't, you know, and, and we'll discuss that. Um, while people are answering, I want to give a couple of data points that I've collected. Um, and first, why, why do we do that, right? And we've been sending gifts to people uh, for a very long time, right? That's not new. However, I'm seeing that since March, the appetite uh, for uh, people to receive gifts is higher. Whether well, it's because they get the gift at home, uh, maybe plays a part, I don't know. But I definitely see a higher appetite for that. And I see more and more companies being uh, more aggressive on the gifting part. And I have myself as a marketer uh, than that. Um, and I'll show you an example. Um, a couple of data points that I see. So um, one company gives their SDRs unlimited send those a budget to drive uh, demos and they, the, the gift they give is AirPods, right? So about $120. Um, and that gets them um, uh, what they say is a very significant boost, uh, like more than 50% boost on the uh, demo takers, okay? You have to speak to somebody to get the gift and to get on a trial, okay? Another company uh, is using it in between the demo booked and the demo attended. And their lift is 43% in attendance rate, which I find fantastic. And I'm going to show you an example of what I've done myself. Uh, there we go. I'm going to share my screen in a second. There you go. So this is an, uh, something that I, I put out for one of my uh, portfolio companies. Uh, this page was shared with uh, e-commerce merchants, so the target market for this uh, product, um, and uh, through targeted ABM ads, targeted emails, and say, hey, Harry, we have X pair of AirPods for you, uh, first come, first serve. Okay, um, really good takeaway. And obviously, if you're not a fit, if you're not qualified, you, you don't get them, right? Um, so now that I've shared that, um, let's go into the discussion. Um, Chris, um, I know you've been doing some gifting at uh, Intelimize. Uh, can you share how like it's shifted uh, and maybe how you're seeing that going forward? So we've done some things. I will say pre-COVID, we, we did some gift card experiments where we were doing a $100 gift card to, to book a demo um, and actually had very poor results in terms of yeah, we got demos booked, but the quality of conversion to actual leads, like we didn't seem to get the right people or we didn't have the sufficient interest or people were maybe taking the, um, uh, the demo just for that, that gift. And so we have been uh, reluctant to dive back into, you know, doing that kind of thing, you know, at the, the similar level in, in value to what the AirPods example that you're, you're describing there. So I think there's, um, you know, maybe a couple things going on with the success that you're seeing versus what our initial experience was a year mm -hmm. ago. Um, you know, maybe people's attitudes have changed as, as you suggested. It may also have to do with um, the product and the price point and the maturity of the company and the, you know, the, the other social proof around and momentum around yeah. all of that um, and ability to target and get the right people involved. Um, you know, it's, it's great to hear that we're seeing this kind of traction. It does make me, want to try another type of experience or another type of yeah. experiment around this. Um, but we've been hesitant to dive back in based on that, you know, mm -hmm. that experience a, a year ago. The gifts that we have done have been more, have been usually lower level, more traditional um, ABM kind of things to help stay, uh, you know, provide that awareness and stay, you know, top of mind for folks. Um, and so, you know, something more personalized like a note and some biscotti or, uh, you know, a small branded item 
would be along the lines, as opposed to an AirPods or something that's that's really gonna, you know, feel like an expensive uh, and more extravagant gift there. And just before we go to Ishii, uh, I gotta share something I forgot to share. The same company that generates the 43% lift by giving, I'd say, uh, a $50 to $100 uh, uh, gift in between uh, the demo booked and the demo attended, uh, try driving new demos by sending uh, a pair of $300 headsets uh, to people. And the results were uh, lots of very bad demos. Uh, and so there's probably a bell curve uh, where um, if the gift is too extravagant, as you say, people will take the demo. I mean, hell, I would take the demo for like a $300 pair of headsets, right? Uh, because why not? But it doesn't mean I'm interested. And so you got to carefully balance the core interest of this person for you buying your product and just the extra nudge that you need to get them like over the fence. Like, okay, I'll take the time now. You're trying to, trying to, do, trying to take people who would potentially buy your product like six months from now or three months from now and bring them to like this week, right? Instead of people who are just not relevant and don't care, say, cool, give me the gift and like I'm going to do emails while, while you're talking, right? Uh, Rishi, what do you think? You know, I, I think pre-COVID, we also had very similar results to what Chris was seeing at Intellimize. I think we we were getting demos, they were coming in, but they were just very, very low quality demos uh, that we were getting out of it. I think, you know, after COVID, what we tried, some gifts that we actually had some really interesting results with were gifts, I don't know if they still apply now, but at least between the March, April, May timeframe were gifts that actually helped you work from home. So one in particular mm -hmm. was a um, sort of a standing desk conversion kit. So basically, I don't know if you've seen those nice. cardboard boxes that you can actually put on your desk. And, you know, we used to use them sometimes in the office. Um, so those, it was, it was actually people needed that and they appreciated that. And, I, and we tried it at various stages of the funnel, um, whether it was the first thing we led with, whether it was, you know, a fourth touch in a sequence, if we were using it for outbound. Um, and we saw some some decent results there. Now, whether or not they would have taken that meeting without the gift, um, you know, when you're using it later down the funnel, uh, who knows? I think when, but when we started with, you know, gifting up front, um, again, it, we started seeing a, a difference in quality of these demos. And so I think that's been an interesting balance for us to fight. Awesome. Uh, Colette, can we share the results of the poll before we move on? Uh, I'd love to see what's... Um... What the results are okay. Oh, wow. Okay, <laughs> 33, 33, 33. I'm not sure what to make of that. <laughs> You're throwing okay. Uh, challenging results, I would say. <laughs> um, so here's what I would say is, uh, yes, definitely it would depend on such the opportunity. Uh, if you haven't tried, I would definitely try and we'll try to find the right balance. For me, the most obvious winners, the most obvious ones, is increasing the demo attendance with people who are already pre-qualified, making sure like they, they, you speed up the process. That's the obvious one, all right? And then as you feel confident, you can move up the funnel a bit, all right? So instead of like giving only people who have bought, start moving up the, uh, the food chain uh, and the sales process slowly and seeing what's the right amount that we should give and what is the lift uh, that we want, that we should expect to pay back the gift and create the right kind of ex experience. Awesome. Thanks, Colette. Um, cool. So the next topic I, I want to cover um, is uh, intent data. And that's kind of like my pet peeve, right? I love intent data. Um, and I've been doing a, a lot of things around intent data. And I think intent data has never been more important than nowadays, right? Uh, so that we can focus our marketing dollars on a smaller list of accounts that are expressing that buying behavior. But it's not easy to, to leverage, right? There's the intent data in a lot of places, but like actually making it actionable is, is hard. And so like, how do you convert that intent data into like MQLs? Um, how do you automate it? So it's part of your funnel, uh, uh, really. Um, so, uh, uh, maybe Chris, you, you can go first on like on intent data and how you'll, how you're leveraging that, uh, at Intelomize or maybe within your clients, if you see some of that. Yeah. So we use intent data that comes in, um, and, you know, tells us when people are looking at our, 
you know, category or reviews on, on G2. That's the most powerful intent data that we see. We also, you know, website visitor and, and that sort of intent data is, is, is another channel, but it's in terms of an external data source, um, we get those alerts and we've got an, you know, integration set up so that um, it comes through and Slack notifications go out. And so we know which companies are engaging and with which competitive products or our own product. And we quickly, uh, you know, identify how to follow up there. Um, one thing that's worked very well for us is to kind of marry that intent data with the personal networks that we all have and using, you know, team link and other things to identify people in the company that might be best to, uh, to uh, reach out to these folks. And, and, you know, so much happens these days. People are, you know, really eager for these personal connections like we talked about, and that's true in terms of referrals and word of mouth. And so it's another opportunity to use that intent, figure out what your connection is and help connect the dots. That's something we would like to automate, you know, more so than we have. I think, uh, you know, Rishi was saying, you know, on the pre-call, some of the things that they've done to automate this and, and bring in, you know, identifiable contacts. Um, so, I, you know, why don't we talk about that a little bit too? Rishi, maybe let you pick it up from there. Yeah, no, absolutely, Chris. It's really interesting. I mean, similar to what you were saying, G, I have, you know, I've had a love-hate relationship with Intent Data for a very long time, but we've, um, I, I think now we've sort of, feel that we've cracked the nut around it and it took us some time to get there but you know we've been heavy users of g2 for example for quite some time and it was not until this year that i feel that we extracted the most value out of it and the way that we did that was uh actually you know i i put together some slides for a lot of previous Go talk ahead. and i share my screen it might be a little bit easier to see what i'm talking about but for sure i just pulled that up can, can you all see my screen Yep. Um, and so, you know, in terms of, you know, it's one thing, what we saw is that first thing there's, there's actually a, to make intent data very useful. It's all about reducing the amount of friction first thing to even make that data actionable. And so what we did, I mean, we're fortunate enough to be able to dog food a lot of what Workado enables um, which is basically bringing, um, you know, what we were able to do is bring data from various sources and create a dossier for our team, whether it's SDRs, AEs, uh, CSMs around uh, where intent might be coming in from. And so in this case, what we did is that, you know, we, we use Slack internally, we all live in Slack, and we created um, a, what we call a G2 bot, which basically is that if there's ever intent happening uh, in any way, shape or form, whether uh, an account might be viewing an alternatives page, a competitor's page, um, uh, our page, so on and so forth. What we will do is that we can first go into uh, our CRM, which is Salesforce and see whether or not this is a target account and create that status. We're then able to pull in, you know, which of our um, reps are assigned to this account. Uh, then you have all the information about that account anything from the CRM. Um, and I think the really powerful combination here was also being able to blend that not only with your CRM data, uh, but also what you may have in your marketing automation tools. So we use Marketo internally. And so for this particular account, what we're able to do, you know, one thing that G2 does is that it gives you account level intent. Yep. We're able to merge that with our marketing data to see hey, have there been any activity from this account by a particular user that may have visited our website, been to a tr uh, visited an event, watched a webinar? And so we can really hone in on, okay, well, this person saw our webinar two weeks ago, and now they're looking at the G2 page. It's most probably this person. So we now have a much better idea of who might be actually um, not only the account, but the person level, uh, lead activity level of who might be doing uh, the intent. Uh, and then also other possible contacts that fit within our ICP within a, that account. And so bringing this information now to a rep um, is really what the game changer was. Uh, before it was, we would have to change, chase folks down and say, hey, go to G2 or pull a report, shove it in their face until they actually reach out to someone. Uh, now we're putting it mm -hmm. to them where they live and work. And then the last thing you can see here is that we're also making it actionable. So from here, they could very quickly add to an outreach sequence. They could um, ignite uh, an ad campaign from here. Uh, we also now have added a button to send uh, a Sendoso gift, if it makes sense um, at that point. 
And so really this has been sort of game changer for us. Um, the other thing that we did too is that intent is not, the way that I look at intent is that um, anything really from a demo request to viewing uh, a G2 page can also be considered intent, um, whether, and it could be at the top of the funnel, it could be at the middle of the funnel. Um, and the, we've also done the, um, the reverse, which is doing a Marketo Sales Insight bot for folks that have already signed up. Uh, now we have their information. Um, and then seeing that if that account that this person has signed up is maybe um, uh, has any sort of history in G2. And so it's basically doing the reverse. Now with Marketo, there's um, interesting moments. And so using that as intent as well uh, and making that easy for the team to take action on. So these have been really cool uh, game changing things for us when it comes to intent. This is hey, amazing. Cool. Just, I think one thing, uh, and one more button you need to get on there is the, uh, you know, add to ABM for website personalization. We, uh, <laughs> that's one of the other things we do with our Slack alerts when they're the accounts that we're, we're targeting, we will go in and, and uh, set up some personalization. So as people come into the site, you know, they're already interested. You can better recognize and uh, take advantage of that. Particularly if they're looking at, you know, for in our case, we're, doing personalization experimentation. If we know they're looking at a lower end AB testing tool, we can put up content that highlights how we're different uh, and have a whole uh, you know, different approach. It doesn't necessarily have to call the account out by name, uh, but you do know what they're interested in by the types of things they're looking at. I love what you did, uh, Rishi. And uh, I had built that myself uh, a couple of years ago. Um, the leveraging the G2 data, not as beautifully, but in Slack. I think what you, the game changer here that people might not recognize is the actionable parts, right? Displaying the data is cool, but at a certain volume, like, as you said, like showing in SDRs or AEs faces, it doesn't work, right? And so being able to like add it to an, uh, an ads, uh, a campaign to an outreach sequence or to internalize to uh, uh, personalize the next visit on your own site is what creates the difference. And by the way, just before we move on, there's Eileen on the chat who asks, uh, can you share what ad connectors you use to like add people to the uh, to that sequence, like you connect that on to ad roll or to like, how does it work? In this case, actually, we we have we do a lot with LinkedIn ads, um, and so awesome, yeah, it makes sense. We we have uh, with the Rocado platform, we have access to um, the campaign creation co connector, so we can actually create and launch ads um, from there. So that's what we're doing. That uh, makes a ton of sense, ABM style. Mm -hmm. um, Awesome, cool. Uh, so the last topic before we go on to the Q and A uh, that uh, I wanted to to try and merge uh, uh, two things together, um, um, rethinking a bit like how we how we nurture uh, leads through the uh, throughout the, the current uh, funnel, right? Um, and and rethinking a, a bit, you know, um, what's your what is your outreach strategy? Whether people already in your database, in your market or, or, or not, right? Um, and I think uh, maybe Chris, I can invite you to think like holistically, like from like, it's not just emails, it's like the entire like content experience uh, from uh, the website to the email. And I think like historically, we've been very focused on like personalizing the emails and having like buckets of personas on emails. And we haven't done that same job on like websites, but the way I think about it, where the moat is going forward is like really have an experience from the ads to the website, to the email, that is kind of like relevant and makes sense uh, through and through. And I know you've done some interesting things uh, there and I'd love if you could share some of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our focus, you know, as an organization is to help people personalize their website. So of course we're doing, you know, the same thing, you know, so testing a lot of different variations on the website that help uh, that buyer as they come in. If they've seen your ad, um, let's say they're on a LinkedIn ad that's highlighting some customer success. As you bring them th to the site, then you want to maybe, there's a video that has that customer feature that you know, is going to help in, engage them where they are. And, and maybe they're going to sign up for a demo right then, but my experience is takes a little bit longer. Um, and so often maybe you'll, you know, they'll go for one of your other um, CTAs on the site, like downloading an ebook or uh, engaging in a different way. And that's where you get into that email nurture where you want to work with them, build that relationship to the point where they are going to raise their hand and say, you know, I do want to talk to sales. I do want to get that demo and really understand how this works. And, and so for us, we've had a lot of focus 
recently on updating and improving that, that nurture campaign so that it fits well with the things we're doing on our site. Um, the nurture content itself, it can't be too salesy. We had to back away from some of the things that we were doing, just promoting blog posts or whole big eBooks or things like that to make it more bite size, more kind of immediately helpful, let people see what um, uh, you know, the possibilities are. And so we created an, an idea series um, uh, for these. I could share briefly what one of these. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and uh, I love examples like, this like what marketers are best at is looking at examples of, that's yeah. of successes and like thinking through how that applies for them. Yeah, if you can see the screen here, what we've done, this is I uh, can. Yeah. just a standard Marketo email. We stripped out a lot of the branding. We left a little banner at the top. Um, people want to know what tactics are working now. So let's look at an example from an actual customer. In this case, it's our customer drift. And the, the theme of this one is meeting your visitor where they are in the buyer journey. So marketers want to understand how to do that. And here's some pictures to show what drift did that resulted in 13% higher conversion from their emails, uh, you know, wow. from, from the website. So their standard website looks like this. The first time you visit as a first time visitor, it says connect with your sales team, the future customers now, right? Return bidders, visitors get this message of, hey, welcome back, ready to get started. So it's recognizing, um, hey, they've moved a little bit along. And this is just one small example of the kind of personalization that, that you can do. Um, and this can lead to other conversations, but this is the kind of thing that is meant to be helpful. We've structured it in a, in a series. So right off the gate, uh, you know, out of the, out of the gate in the subject line, we say, hey, this is idea number one website optimization ideas that drive lift right now. So you're sort of setting the stage that they can expect to see more of these. And let's say the first one they see is website idea number four, they might go back in their, in their history to see some of these other things. And we've gotten a lot of very positive feedback, um, you know, from these just anecdotally, but you know, if you start to look at the, the metrics, our click through rates up almost 80% and 79% increase in click through rate on these. And at the same time, 63% fewer unsubscribes from this approach to nurture since, since we've made this change. So we're feeling wow. that, you know, people are really hungry for these kind of helpful content ideas and, and what they can do to market today and, and shifting the nurture in that direction where there's just one big idea and a quick example from a real customer is working a lot for us. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. And just before we go to the Q&A, Rishi, I remember that you boasted in the past like being able to have one of the fastest response times and like helping orgs, like uh, making like that, um, let's say uh, inbound as frictionless as possible. And so I love if you could share like what's, what's your team's response time. And I tried it and it's damn fast. Uh, if you haven't, go ahead and try and work out or like put, uh, put, in, put in for a demo and see how fast they follow up. Uh, but I'd love to know like, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the desired time and what's the trick? Like, because I've, we've all had organizations where we had sales team that would follow up like the next day or two days uh, afterwards, right? So I wonder like, what's, what's the trick and what's your time? Uh, my my team that might be listening is going to hate me for saying this, but <laughs> the, the SLA Go for it. that, Go for it. that we sort of have internally is, is five minutes. Uh, so for anybody wow. that, um, that, that comes and requests a demo to the site, um, actually, you know, 24-7, uh, we, have, we have coverage. 24-7? 24 seven. So it's, um, wow. it's, it's, and we, and we have, cause we have, uh, you know, quite a few users abroad as well. And, oh, um, nice but, uh, you know, the five minutes is, is the magic number. And we've seen that time and time again, a lot of our customers use our solution to achieve that number. I can just quickly share, I know we're running low on time. Uh, but the, the way that we got that number, there was um, a Harvard Business Review that was done. Yeah. To really show. It's, it's like 2012, right? It's like, it's not new. It's not new at all. And, and yeah. I think the, that the, the data has been there for forever, right? We just haven't acted on it. And we've seen, we've done a poll. I don't have the exact numbers. We've done a poll as to how many, you know, SaaS companies are even in this range. And it's, it's still in the hours, if not days. Um, and, uh, but we, you know, a lot of our customers really uh, appreciate just the lift that they're seeing from reducing this response time. So as you can see here, uh, it's just after that five minute mark, you have an exponential decrease in um, the number of meetings that you'll end up booking uh, in general. And the way that we yeah. go about doing it is very similar to, you know, what we talked about um, with uh, what we've done with the G2 bot, but this is our, our demo form here on the left. And as you can see here, 
um, you know, very few fields. Uh, we're using, you know, a decent amount of enrichment uh, to kind of uh, get that information. And what our team sees on the back end as soon as this happens is that there, uh, we have what's called sort of a, a, a work bot, which is a bot built in Slack using Workato um, to one, bring in all of the enriched data sources. So we now know where that company is located, the size, uh, revenue numbers, uh, we have sort of the use case that they've already provided us. We have their contact information, including phone number. So there's no context switching that really needs to happen. And what you don't see on this screen is the ability to start taking action. So from here, being able to reassign, accept, reject, so on and so forth. Uh, and then we've added some buttons now to, re to even ignite a phone call straight from um, this, this Slack bot for our SDR team. So. It's been something that uh, we now, we you obviously use internally. There's a lot of our customers, Sales Loft is one of them that's using it uh, as well. Uh, they've built up their own version. And what's also happening in the background is it's solving a lot of the marketing ops problems around syncing things like Marketo with Salesforce at the same time um, while bringing all this data wow. into and making it actionable. Wow, I want that. Uh, awesome. Um, cool. Thank you very much. Let's go into the Q and A. We have a, a bunch of great questions. Uh, Colette, are you going to display? Yes. Awesome. Thank Let you, Colette. Let me pull up the Q and A. All right. So these are the questions so far. Okay. Let's try and go in rapid fire. We have a bunch of questions and uh, only like twelve minutes. So. Uh, it would be awesome if we could just take one person answers one question and we just like uh, move on. Um, Rishi, you want to go for the first one? Sure. Uh, what are some growth trends you are seeing and what are important skills one should hone to acquire and be ready? Uh, <clears throat> so some other interesting trends that we haven't mentioned on the call, uh, you know, we, like I talked about at the beginning of, of the chat around keeping a really close ear to the ground. Uh, one thing that we found in a lot of our outbound prospecting is people are picking up the phone uh, a lot more than before. Uh, they don't have really have many other places to go these days. And so uh, we've seen a lot of success in terms of booking meetings uh, via phone. Our number one channel to book meetings used to be email, uh, and now it's on on phone. Um, so that's that's one thing. I think another thing that we're seeing is uh, folks are... Um, in we use we leverage Gong uh, quite a bit internally, and we've run some automations to, to actually analyze uh, some of these conversations that we're having, and we're seeing interesting trends in the words that are coming up in these calls. So budget timing um, are are now much more prevalent in our calls than ever before, and so we use that information now to actually create battle cards for these topics that are trending. Uh, so very much so uh, keep an eye on what you're getting internally from, from what you're already seeing from a lead standpoint. There's a lot of data there that you can really hone into. Awesome. Thanks, Rishi. Uh, let's have Chris take the second one. So with companies having budget cuts, what would you advise on how um, we should delegate the remaining budgets for? Okay, I think here's what sucks is there's not one answer for this, right? It's an it depends kind of go for one kind of answer, right? And so what you're doing is now looking at, okay, what are the things that, that we have in the plan and what is the ROI that we're getting from those? And, and you know, some measurement angles and, and ROI calculation angles are, are more important than ever. You're probably going to increase budget on some things that you weren't doing before. You're saving a heck of a lot of money on, on in-person events. There may be some big conferences you could, you know, save that whole budget. Now you've got um, room to increase your budget and say paid ads or something like that if that ROI is there. You know, marketers love to take something that works and do it until it doesn't. So watch for that saturation, watch for things to, to flatten out. But where that curve is still steep and you're getting good return on the investment, I, you know, I say look for the things that are working and, and double down in those areas. And, and uh, you know, for the things that are less certain, that's where you're going to have to pull back. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. I'll go for the, I'll go for the next one. Uh, is AI the next phase of um, operationalizing predictive intent data? So uh, this is actually from one of your coworkers at Workato. I love that. Um, uh, yes. Uh, um, I'm going to be a bit more precise, though. Uh, two things. I'm going to do a shameless plug. One of my portfolio companies is working uh, on, towards that direction that called metadata. 
And so it's a dynamic ads based on intent data. But my, my feeling is that if you go a step further, um, we're getting more and more intent data. Uh, G2 is one example, but there's lots of other examples. You could take like hiring data, job data, whatever. And we have lots of output sources, uh, ads, uh, as we, she showed us, uh, emails, maybe gifts. And eventually what it's going to look like, it's not a human picking an account, looking at all the intent data and deciding what the next step should be. It's going to be a bidding system, call it an AI if you want, that bids how valuable is that account, how likely are they to close, what's the predicted ACV, and thus, what is the best investment we can make in amount and in type to close them to maximize margin and preserve revenue or preserve revenue, maximize margin if you want, right? So that's what it's going to look like. So it's very similar to what exists in the B2C world. You can look at like uh, a real-time bidding solutions like Criteo in the B2C world applied to B2B. That's what it's going to look like uh, in my honest opinion. Uh, next. Um, we could do one more question. We still have some time. Okay. What do you want to pick here? A lot of ones. Um, I can I can just touch on the on the next one in terms of the best growth initiative. I think you know we talked a lot about in this conversation around a lot of the the growth initiatives that we talked about were surrounding sort of new late new logo revenue. I think uh, one of the things that we've been seeing a lot of success with is. Um, don't forget your existing customers. Uh, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of meat on the bone there. It's much easier uh, to to you know farm than to create. And we have uh, we've seen a lot of success from um, spending a lot more time with our existing customers and you know expanding into those accounts. All right. Okay. So I think we'll. You know, taking time in the consideration will wrap up. So you have a great day ahead. Thank you, everyone. So thanks. Thank you.